get started. Our uh, next speaker is Steve Rogalski. Uh, Steve is a founding member of the uh, Winnipeg Agile User Group, and he wanted everybody here to know that uh, he has played in a handbell choir. Um, so the skills are obviously transferable. Yes. And we'll find out how. Steve. <laughs> no, we won't. <laughs> Uh, actually, the, the skill that's transferable is that I was a pretty bad failure at it. Uh, I was allowed two bells, maybe sometimes three, and if the song was really hard, the girl beside me, who was really good, would take one of mine, so I would only actually have one. <laughs> so, actually, what I want to do to start, see if this, there we go. Uh, many of you, you know some of your people at your table, just turn and say hi, and I want you to tell them one of those two stories, either an adoption story or that nightmare project that you talk about at the bar and that you, you uh, try to forget and you have nightmares about. So just tell your stories to your neighbors, make sure they know your name, and tell one of those stories. And you might have to tell your neighbor's story later on. So. So who's got the worst project story? Who, who, you're not finished? Okay, keep going, sorry. I, you're still telling your worst story. That means it's really bad. I want to hear it. I'll give you another minute then. Okay, so who has the worst story? Who, who, who heard the worst story from there? Yeah, that's echoing, I'll let you fix that. Maybe it's over here. Who has the worst project story? Can you volunteer your neighbor to tell your worst story? Anybody, I'm gonna tell a bunch more stories, so don't feel like you need to be embarrassed. I'm gonna tell you a bunch of horror stories, so uh, this is all family here. Does anyone have a story they wanna tell? Sure. So you delivered a project that nobody wanted and everyone was happy? Okay. <laughs> and then they're happy about it. Yes. Well, this topic here, uh, failing, uh, I, have, I don't have a story like that. Maybe, so anyone else have a story like that? You delivered, it wasn't what they wanted, and they said, oh, thank you. <laughs> no? Okay, otherwise, we need clients. But no, just kidding. 
Uh, <laughs> we prefer the other kind of client. Uh, the fail fast uh, is really quite an, a great concept, but it's always kind of bothered me that we have projects like this that fail slow, and for me, my slow failure, the big long project that wasn't very successful, that had lots of problems, was actually the project that gave me the kick in the pants uh, to move forward into the fail fast mode. So sometimes failing slow, and you'll hear a bunch of those stories today, is the kick in the pants you need uh, in order to make a transition. So, and I'm going to try to tie that into actually some of Linda's work, because I heard uh, her talk today. I heard her talk earlier this summer, and uh, there's actually a lot of uh, similarities between people and organizations. Um, so since her talk, I have a brother-in-law who's a psychologist, and I did ask him to do the research in their library of dissertations that he has access to, uh, to see, see if the mindset is the same for organizations as, and teams as it is for individuals. So uh, I think you'll see some commonalities between her talk and how they apply that to business. Um, I'm also very interested when, when the topic came out about agile elephants, and two of the elephants had to do with failure. One is the elite or the commercial interest censoring failure. So if it didn't work for you, it's because you weren't good enough or you didn't do it right. And the other one is very similar. It's the, uh, again, the, the elite saying you failed because you weren't good enough. So those two things, both censoring failures and being defensive about it, uh, I wanted to tackle those elephants because I think they're I think we're missing out on an opportunity if we, in fact, are censoring them or uh, excusing them or defending them. Um, so I'm going to tell you, again, I, I'm one of the organizers of the Winnipeg Agile User Group, and as I prepared for this talk, I went and interviewed a bunch of the teams and organizations that come to our group, and I just asked them to tell me their story. And it turns out the, my own story plus the three other organizations that I interviewed also had these stories of our transition started with a failure that project that you guys just talked about, some of you, that was awful. And that was actually the, the kick in the pants again to move forward. So we're going to tell the failure stories. We're all going to have a pity party. And then we're going to tell you kind of some of the ways that these four teams, these four organizations, moved from failure to success. And then, you know, the fail slow at the beginning with the, with the uh, fail fast at the end. And then tips from their words and then also the results, what they're doing now and how they're improving and what that looks like for the coaches and consultants and speakers in the room. I hope this gives you some hope that there are teams that listen to your advice. Uh, maybe you weren't even there or don't even know about it, but there are teams that listen to your advice and make it and it sticks. And for the rest of you in the room who are maybe on that team and in that organization that's trying to change and is struggling, some hope and some tips for how to get there. And my clicker there. A little bit about me, this is my uh, Family, yeah, we spent two weeks out in BC this summer. So this is uh, the uh, in near Tofino at that Long Beach, which is a beautiful place. Um, I call myself a process hacker. Uh, family is super important to me, and so is the people first attitude. The uh, company I work for, if you walk in our building kind of any time of day, you will hear someone say it's all about the people. Uh, we're a very flat organization. We have a, a CEO uh, and then the rest of us. Uh, and even then, he puts himself on our level. We make decisions together. We have yearly planning meetings together. And what the group decides, uh, the CEO has one vote, I have one vote. And that's our direction for the year. So that people first attitude is really excellent and kind of embedded into me, both at work and other places. And then you can see some of my other uh, interests. Uh, coaching, that's both at work and also outside work. I do a lot of, uh, I coach my daughter's basketball. So. The rest, yeah, you can see my Twitter and those kind of things. So, a little bit about the stories that I'm going to tell you. Um, we're going we're gonna, to, again, I'm going to tell you these four stories. We're going to have our little pity party. And I don't want you to add to the, any jokes you have about Winnipeg at this moment. Because at the end, you're going to see that it turns out all right. So you really have no reason. Or maybe you have a window of about half an hour to add to your jokes. But we don't tell jokes about you. We save them for Saskatchewan and Toronto. So we're kind of, if we can be on that together. Um, there's also the four stories. Two of the failure stories are waterfall-ish projects. Two of the failure stories are teams trying to figure out how to do Agile. So there's kind of the breadth. Also, the stories, we don't have the large enterprise stories. The kind of IT departments for these groups are between <coughs> 5 and 40. 
Uh, so we don't have that. If you want the big story, Chad's over there, and he, he missed his talk already, but he'll, he'll gladly tell you some more. So if you're looking for that kind of story, I hope you can still get some tips and some hope out of this, but this is kind of the, this is the reality of Winnipeg. The uh, large organizations that of that size are still in mid-transition, and they, uh, well, they're, they're working their way towards it. Um, okay. First story. Friesen's Printing is one of the top printers in North America. Uh, they have over 50 applications in all kinds of different languages uh, and an IT department that supports them of seven. They do lots of Power Builder and uh, they have some Flex stuff and all kinds of stuff. Their top issues, oh, and you know, they do like 3D printing and cool stuff. And if you've read Harry Potter books in Canada, they're probably printed there, so just south of Manitoba, south of Winnipeg. A uh, really great place, a really old organization. Lots of good culture Im embedded in that organization. Top issues for their department of seven. I guess the biggest one, or the biggest two or three, lots of silos. So the power builder guy is the power builder guy. The flex guy is the flex guy. The service person writes all the services. And that's how they've operated for years. Uh, they, so if there's interruptions, which happen all the time, if it's a, for a power builder app, it's going to be that only that you have to fix it. You can't help anyone. And in fact, there's kind of a sense of healthy or unhealthy competition that built between them that I was, I was going to be so great at Power Builder that I wasn't even going to help you. And if you, weren't, if you were in trouble, uh, too bad. In fact, uh, one of their, they actually had weekly developer meetings where they report on their status, which many groups do. One person was stuck on a problem for three quarters of a year and no one helped them. So the culture of their teams supported that kind of thing from ha happening. Uh, lots of requirements issues and lots of inaccurate project estimates. They had these uh, mammoth god classes is what they call them, like the 15,000 line classes. Uh, clearly, you bring in someone new, can you please maintain this class? Oh, absolutely, this is great, 15,000 lines, awesome. Uh, versus the, you know, they've made the change since then. But So that's kind of, and then they started tackling a new project within this environment. They wanted to put, um, they do yearbooks online now, so it's called Designer's Edge Online. And then they wanted to create this flex website that can do, you can basically hand this over to a school and you can design your yearbook on your own. Uh, it's currently a really fantastic site. But on that, at that point, they had hired a consultant in to come help them, a specialist in flex. But again, because they work in silos, the flex guy did all the flex stuff. And then there was the backend stuff, the service guy did all the service stuff. So what happened was this project was not going all that well and the consultant left the company. And they have to deliver because they promised in a certain amount of time. If you miss the yearbook school year, you're waiting a whole nother year. So now, like, what do we do? So this is the failure point for this project, where they're like, for this team. We don't know what to do. We're stuck. Please help. Actually, I don't even know if they said please help. But they asked each other that. Next story. This one it has the biggest ties to a large enterprise, if that's where you're coming from. Uh, this is a Manitoba Hydro subsidiary. They broke, they kind of, you know, they started with Manitoba Hydro and then they became their own company, but they're still owned by Manitoba Hydro. It's AutoCAD for the power systems industry. And you can see they have a large amount of licenses. Their drawings, for their AutoCAD drawings compiled to Fortran. And uh, it's, a really, it's a really interesting place to work because they're doing all this architectural stuff with, with drawings. If you're interested in AutoCAD stuff, this is, it's really cool. Uh, you show me some of their stuff. Top issues, they decided to, in order to reach a new market, they had to rewrite the whole application. Uh, and because the data was decentralized in all different components, and the application was special, really great for one specific thing, which was let's model the current environment, and then focus in on one area and do some simulations to kind of make, improve that area. But it wasn't great at doing the larger scale stuff, modeling larger stuff, and simulating across things because it took too long to, to set that up. So they wanted to rewrite their whole application so it would be more flexible to reach a lot more users. So users are unhappy. They got support and compatibility nightmares. The project was taking way too long. They're a year into this rewrite, and they realize, you know, we're never going to make it. We're way over our head. We're not delivering anything to our customers. Nobody actually wants to make this big change all at once and uh, brand new technology. So, does anyone have a story similar to this, a project rewrite that just goes, seems to go on and on and on? Anyone had a, I, I have a couple of clients who have 
and I don't know if I've ever been, but a couple of clients that I'm working with that are exactly like this. Uh, it's a nightmare. It's really frustrating. You never get, never seem to get anywhere, and as soon as you do, the old requirements change and the old system, and you got to change them to the new one, and then you fall further behind. So this is their failing slow point where they got to after a year and said, what are we going to do? Uh, this is uh, a more recent, well actually they're all recent examples. This is a smaller example. A uh, consultant in Winnipeg, his name is Mike, um, works, he has a cold wind software. Uh, and uh, he decided he wanted to start his own startup. So he had this idea for an online scheduling system for small businesses. Uh, it's using the Google, Google Web Toolkit framework, if you're interested in that. Uh, they have great experience with it. They love that framework for their building their online scheduling. It just ties into Google and does all kinds of magic. I'm not even sure how it works other than that they love it. Um, they started Agile in quotes right away, uh, in quotes, uh, because they were doing a lot of the good things, uh, iterations and breaking things into stories, using Kanban boards, those kind of things. But once they did their first release, they started to form their team in May after they got funding. They did their first release in September, which went okay. And then eventually the marketing group came in at this point and said, now we're promising our customers our next features. When can you have it done? And their answer was, we don't know. Because they hadn't been measuring their velocity at all. They have no idea. And started to have quality issues when team morale was starting to dropping. Uh, as part of their process, the owner, Mike, with the, along with the four developers, Mike did all the QA and they saved it. Other than code reviews, they saved all the QA to right before the release happened. So he was testing it all by himself. Yeah, I know, it's terrible. Just wait till the end of the story. Wait till the end of the story. This is good. The end of the story is much better. Uh, so this is what they were doing, is he would test before the release, but then he was finding so many defects in the code and so many defects, and then they would fix that one, and it would break something else. This one here where they, they added a feature and broke the login is a true story. It's like, well, yeah, you added the feature, but I can't log in to use it. So, fantastic. So the trust between the developers and the owner, Mike, was broken. The trust between Mike and his customers, because he would go demo the application to new customers, potential new clients, and suddenly, oh, this is really embarrassing, this isn't working. Right, so the trust was broken all along. And they came to this point where they said, okay, now after uh, starting in May, and now this was kind of just after September, they were came, come, came to a point where they knew they needed to change something. Now this is my story. Uh, and this is a story that I share pretty much every time I talk, uh, given the reason why I'm into Agile. And if, I, I don't know if you know this, but the speakers are all getting interviewed in the room during the week. So I'm telling a little bit about that story there. But this is why I got into Agile, is because of my story. I've talked a little bit about Protegra already, uh, that we're lean focused uh, as far as an organization and being flat. Uh, we came into lean before we came into Agile, so it's, a, it's been a really nice fit for us. Um, and then we apply lean and Agile to all these things, business process. There's a story in, Ma in Manitoba about the labor and immigration and bringing in professionals from outside and taking the uh, time it takes for them to get in from a certain amount of time and kind of cutting kind of it in half, as well as putting in way more people at the same time without actually adding any resources or add, hiring more people. But just by making the teams work together. It's basically one giant self-organizing team before it, went, it was lots of silos. So using Lean to do business process kind of stuff, which is, if you get a chance to hear those kind of stories, it's really interesting and you'll recognize the language they use. I went to a Lean office forum and we basically talked the same language of how they're you know, um, making their order entry better is the same thing we applied to Agile to make software development better. Uh, we also do so have some prog products. If you're interested in payroll as a software as a service, let me know. Or people tracking, which is the Correlate, a uh, couple of joint ventures. And the, uh, we have been twice the number one small and medium business in Canada because of the flatness of our organization. Our engagement numbers and our surveys are apparently off the charts. Uh, so we all love working there and it's great. It's not perfect, but it's great. A little background before I tell my failure story. We have this fantastic success story. PMI project of the year. The uh, Manitoba government promised, the premier promised the Manitoba, Manitoba people that he would put in a parks reservation service online by April. No one could do it, including his own internal. So we got volunteered. We said, we went to our, this was before I started working there. We went, the company went to the employees and said, this is the challenge. No one's taking the premier up on it. 
because no one thinks they can do it. You think you can do it. So we formed a team that was saying, yeah, we're willing to go for it and fail if, the, if necessary. We're going to do our best to do it. And it was this kind of perfect storm of good things of uh, a product owner that knew exactly what she wanted and how to prioritize and a deadline that they had to meet. They did all kinds of frequent delivery. At this point, we didn't even heard about automated testing, and if we had, uh, it would have been too scary probably to try. So we actually, our, our automated tester was an architect that we brought on the team, and his full-time job was regression testing. So that's how we got past the automated testing. I think automated testing now is probably a little cheaper than hiring a person, but whatever. Uh, and it was a great success. If you want to hear this story, this is my friend Terry uh, that I work with, and that's his blog there. And he tells the story of this and how it actually, while it was a great story, contributed to some of the failures of some of the other projects. And now, this is why. The next project, I got thrown on kind of midway. The next project, we tried to duplicate that success out of context. And we learned that we didn't learn enough in that first one. We learned that our success blinded us to the things that actually didn't go well. Our success blinded us to the circumstances that were going really well that enabled us to have success. Like a, gr a product owner, one product owner who knew what they were doing versus three product owners with competing influences. Um, that, there was a, a hard deadline with a known solution. They knew exactly what it had to do. This project, uh, a much more unknown solution. And if you've ever seen this anti-pattern, uh, iteration cycles of you do three weeks of development and two weeks of testing, don't do that. It's not good. <laughs> it's really not good. Because the three weeks of dev just keeps bleeding in, then suddenly it's four weeks of dev and one week of testing, and then it's four and a half weeks of dev and one week of testing, and then it's five weeks of dev and we don't test. And you, can, you should see the defects piling up. And that was my job, was to do uh, both requirements and testing on this project and kind of own the overall solution, and I couldn't keep up with those defects. And they were literally in the hundreds and even higher. Um, we, our stories were too big. If you're not breaking down your stories, this is a great time to start on, let's see, are you working tomorrow? Tomorrow is a great time to start breaking down your stories. And also, uh, we delivered in vertical slices, which means that we built the search functionality first, and it was perfect and beautiful. Hardly any defects in there, awesome. Then we went and built some of the other big feature, right top to bottom, and top to bottom, and then we started running out of money about here, and so the other ones, we could, you could search for anything in this application by various methods with all kinds of displays and gadgets that you could pull out, but it was really hard to cost and price an item, which is the core of the system. So, I preach all the time in, in Winnipeg and other places, horizontal slices, because then you can make those decisions better. And if you do run out of money, you don't have the perfect uh, search item, you have the perfect cost and price item with a basic search item. So, perfect storm of problems. Again, if, Joanna, I think yesterday in your keynote you talked about digging a little deeper. So this was, hey, we're awesome. This was digging a little deeper, right? You're finding the problems that are underneath, that all the things we're actually doing wrong that we didn't even know about at that time. So, what does it feel like to be wrong? What does it feel like to be wrong? Not very good. Not very good? How about you? What does it feel like to be wrong? Trying to, how about you? Learn from, but what does it feel like? What are the emotions that you're feeling when you're actually feels wrong? Like crap. Feels like crap. It's actually not true. This is what it feels like when you're wrong. <laughs> it feels like being right. And it's only after you realize you're wrong and that you're in trouble that you feel that way. So this is where we were right before, at the, near the end of those stories, we are doing our best. We are, I was working 60 to 80 hours a week trying to get this project on the right track, doing everything I knew and all my skill sets. Uh, and I'd been successful before, so this is the, kind of the first big failure for me. Uh, I, I'm re I was really good at Waterfall until this point when we tried this Agile thing, which was nuts. Um, this is how we felt. We're like, we're doing everything we can, and then suddenly, oops. So, and sometimes, and I, my, I was talking with some friends about this, uh, this feeling, you don't, sometimes you know this feeling before you get to here, right? Sometimes you know it as you're walking off the edge. For example, I know I have a problem, I'm, I'm very organized in general, but I have a problem taking my watch off and leaving it somewhere. Which is why today, I have a souvenir watch from Vancouver with a moose on it. Right? Because I left my watch at my friend's house a few days ago. And he's going to ship it to 
He's, he's flying to Ontario, he's giving it to a friend of mine there who's flying to Winnipeg to give it back to me. But I think I'm just going to keep my moose watch on as a reminder for a while. So sometimes we know we're wrong, but usually we're in this case. And a lot of our people that we're trying to convince to be agile are even, they're, maybe they're even still on the flat ground, but it would take some time and some effort and some self-realization sometimes to go to this. So. This, uh, the kind of question I just asked you in the example I just gave, um, oh, no, sorry, that's the next slide. I, I inserted the slide after Linda's talk. So maybe this failing slow is what pushes us from here to the agile mindset here. Maybe that big failure that we have is enough to say, okay, now I want to learn from my failure instead of uh, having that smart mindset, right? So it's, it's a hypothesis I came up with this morning. It, it rings true in my experience. It rings true in the stories of the, of the teams I've talked about. Uh, the example I gave with the Roadrunner, uh, uh, has anyone seen the wrongologist? Yes, so you weren't surprised with the Roadrunner? No, got it. see. This is a really fantastic book. Uh, I would highly suggest going to look on, her, on, t on the TED website for her talk. It's about a 15 minute talk. And she talks about being wrong all the time and what that means and what that looks like and how hard that is to switch. Um, and if, again, going back to the Agile mindset, we believe that people make mistakes, right? But it's not us, it's somebody else. And the mindset of uh, being Agile and learning from mistakes is actually a hard one to go into. And I think one of the things you mentioned last time I heard your talk is that we, while most of us are, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, we, we sit on one camp or the other. In some circumstances, we move back and forth. So, you know, even though I consider myself as, as a boy who that picture could have been me that you, that you showed, and I learned those kind of things, and I, I love learning new things and all kinds of stuff, I have been here enough times before I went to this, right? So, sometimes we have error blindness is, is kind of the word that she uses. And... Uh, Here's an example. What kind of person do you, do you think wrote this test? And if you're a, an Agile mindset, maybe you have a better answer. But typically you think this is the lazy person, the dimwit, the dumb one, the one who's not smart who wrote this test. By the way, that's supposed to be mystery and skunk. Right? This is a failed spelling test. This is why the person who didn't try, who didn't study, it's not me. But sometimes we're wrong and we don't know it. My personal, I think it rings true for all of us that what I believe now is not what I believed 10 years ago or even last week. I'm always learning something new and there are things I, was, I was thought I was right about six months ago in the Agile world about certain practices and where they'd be used well that I realize now, huh, I've kind of changed my opinion. So sometimes just being wrong is okay and we're going to learn from it. This is one of the quotes, uh, this is Trish from Friesen's. And she said this in, in my interview with her. It's Trish and Brent from Friesen's Printing, by the way, who kind of are leading the change in the people that are interviewed. When you're used to doing certain things a certain way, you become blind to other options, right? We know that. We invest a lot of time in those other ways. We go for our PMPs. We maybe get our, our IIBA certification or whatever it is. We teach our courses on how to estimate properly and we do all kinds of stuff to make sure that we're as good as we can be in our industry and, you know, we are, like I said, I was really good and invested in Waterfall. I was the guy at the organization who was helping us refine our, our, our Agile, our, sorry, our Waterfall documentation, right? Let's set a standard for what a good requirements document looks like and a test plan and those kind of things. I was that guy investing all kinds of things and I was blind to these other ways. Uh, in the... Uh, in her Being Wrong book, she talks, uh, and you can find this stuff on the web too, I don't know if she talks about it in the book or not, but there's an example of the Innocence Project where people are blind to, to their uh, failures. Um, this project looks for cases in the US where DNA was not used to convict somebody of murder or some, those kind of things, but now the DNA evidence and the techniques are available to prove or disprove their innocence. So they go and look for these cases and then help that person, and they're, they're not always right either when they actually end up the case, but sometimes you'll find that they'll have convicted somebody who was clearly not guilty. 
and the DNA evidence proves it, and the DNA evidence will point to someone over here who was in that area at the time, who has a history of doing those things, and it's clearly that person who did it. But even after they are cleared in the court cases, the DA and the, uh, and actually it's interesting, it's about 50% of the time is what they said, the DAs and the lawyers and the people who have prosecuted that case are absolutely convinced that they got the right person in the first place and that the DNA evidence is wrong, they make up all kinds of excuses, right? This is the typical error blindness and it's about 50% of the time, so maybe that actually correlates really well with a fixed versus smart mindset. But these are the people in our organizations that we're dealing with, right? So, regarding elephants, this is Nanny McPhee. You can tell I'm a dad of young kids. Elephant sleep. Can you see that elephant sleeping on the bed there? What a great movie if you have kids. It's just very fun. The two elephants that I talked about, how does censoring failure or being defensive about failure talk about those things? Well, like I said, I have a brother who's a psychologist, and I asked him to do, a brother-in-law rather, I asked him to do all kinds of research on my behalf, and he sent me a bunch of papers and printed them off. I've got most of them here if you want to look at them later. Some of them we just get abstracts with, because in order to get the full dissertation, you've got to actually mail out for the library and the, the dissertation, and they'll print it from the university. But the, he found two studies for me that were very interesting and also relate very directly, I think, to the Agile mindset. The first is a 1995 study exploring the effects of failure norms in teams at an automotive manufacturer. So they interviewed all the teams to kind of measure what their failure norms were, as in when a gap happens in performance, how do they look at that gap? Do they look at it as something they are being defensive about, or do they look at it as something they are accepting and calling failure and learning from it? And what they found was, and this is, so they picked of all the teams, they picked the five teams that were the highest failure norms and the lowest failure norms. Two at the top and three at the bottom. About 31 people. They studied them for two years. And of course, this is what they found. The central idea of this dissertation is that search is not an inevitable response to performance gaps as presumed. Rather, search is a response to failure only if people are encouraged to accept failure by strong acceptance norms. The people Right? This is the fixed versus agile mindset right there. The people who say, there's a gap, it's a failure, let's look at it and learn from it, are the ones who learn. The organizations and teams who look at a gap and call it a failure are the ones who learn more in, in this case. So really, again, the, the language is the same, the findings are the same. So this is for teams rather than just individuals. Second study in 2010, so this one's much more recent. The orbital launch vehicle industry is really fascinating because there is data for every single attempt in the world ever. Right? So you've got all the outliers measured. You can't ignore any data. Success is easily because uh, did, the, did the satellite make it into orbit or not? Did the rocket blow up or not? Right? Did people die or not? Uh, so starting with, I think, 1957 with a Sputnik 1 and uh, all the way till March 2004 is the breadth of the study. Uh, it's also really interesting because there's a super high incentive to succeed in this industry, right? Because the costs are so high. You want to be the company with the high success rate, and lot, there are lots of them out there. So, what did they find looking at this almost 50 years of data between organizations, and how did they respond to failure? And they were looking at, does the amount of failure and the magnitude of failure contribute more to your success than your history of success. So how, how does failure fit into how well an organ, as an, you do as an organization? And just as a kind of looking at the data, this is, these are the success of failure rates from 57 to 2002. So you can see they actually have a better track record than software projects, according to the chaos studies. Taking a rocket up to space, better track record than us. But you can see even now they have about a 7-ish percent failure rate over the last little while. But what they found was organizations learn more effectively from failures than success. And in fact, the magnitude of failure, it increased how much they learned in the future and how much their organization innovated and increased. So now, looking at those four failure stories that I just talked about and your own four failure stories, there's a little bit of hope here actually. Secondly, that 
uh, the most, sorry, the significant implication of this study for practice is that leaders in your organization should neither ignore failures or stigmatize those involved with them. Rather, leaders should treat failures as invaluable learning opportunities and encourage open sharing of information about them. I think we've heard this before in the Agile community, right? This is nothing new for us, but this proves that this exists in organization and that's important. And finally, and if you remember my story, this is really interesting. Prior success also leads decision makers to think, we're good enough. We don't need to look for new ways to innovate. PM, you know, waterfall processes in our, in our PMO office, we're good enough. We don't have major problems, right? We're good enough. We don't need to search for new ways to do things. And that was the case even with our first Agile project. We're, that, that PMI project of the year was certainly good enough. It was a huge success. And that caused us to think we'd figured it out and we didn't need to keep looking. So, again, we, we know this information. That's a funny little thing. I'll let you read that. I like that one. That idea sucks, right? Yep. Back to the elephants. If we are censoring our failures, as an industry or as the elite or commercial interested in our failures, that means we're not learning from them. So if we're, and if we're being defensive about our failures, that means we're not learning from them. So if the, if the blame is on the commercial interests for both, and the elite in this industry for both censoring those failures and for being defensive and finding excuses for them, they're actually halting the progress of Agile. So let's get rid of those elephants altogether, right? That, that right there is very interesting. Uh, application of the elephants in this story. And just to take it to one point further, censoring or denying or being defensive about failure is unagile. In waterfall projects, we plan failure out of the system. Right? We plan for failure to not be in there at all. We can plan everything in the front so that failure doesn't happen. On agile projects, we know that a failure is going to happen. We know we're going to make some mistakes and we test for it all along. So if we're censoring and being defensive about those failures, we're actually being unagile. So what does this have to do? Oh yeah, in fact, if you suppress failure, you might be guaranteeing it because you're not going to improve. So how do we get out of this mindset? Bill Clinton read this Being Wrong book and in reaction to a quote from the Tea Party, you said, uh, we consider compromise a weakness all or nothing, as in we never get anything wrong, <coughs> right? As, what a ridiculous statement. They ought to read this book, this Being Wrong book, because it basically says we need to embrace our errors and not be ashamed of them, because that will enable us to learn from our mistakes and be more creative. And ha that has to be true in our industry too, as knowledge workers. So we celebrate our failures, right? Ah. Ever seen the website cakerex.com? He's like, yes, my wife loves, she giggles every morning at Cake Rex and it's uh, just fine. I don't always find them as funny as she does, but this one was particularly funny. Uh, we celebrate our failures and that's kind of tip number one. When you have these big projects that fail, uh, we can do a few things. We can make, have failure cakes. And there's a couple of those I've heard that kind of starting in the industry where people are making failure cupcakes and bringing them to their retrospectives and say, what did we learn and fail about this time? Let's, let's have a party. Uh, and maybe that celebrating is the kick that allows the smart people, because here now you're succeeding when you fail. I don't know, maybe, maybe there's a correlation there. I haven't really thought about it until, uh, during, that's one of the things I was thinking about during your talk. But maybe that celebrating failures allows the smart people to say, okay, this is okay to fail. Now I'm one of the cool kids who's, who's failing. I don't know, maybe that's backwards. Um, there are a couple of things, if you read the Agile literature, that people are trying right now. They're bringing in, does anyone do improv? in the room, the failure bow when you make a mistake, <laughs> right? And if you've ever played a game called Language Hunters or Where Is Your Keys, uh, one of the things you do, it's a game, it's really fascinating research on how people learn and they, it's, they're focusing on how to teach people a new language and all the different uh, techniques you can do to make this real happen really fast versus uh, slow over a long time, right? How do, you, how do we teach things really fast? And you take that research into Agile, you take that research into how you do your, your workshops and all kinds of things. Um, but one of the things is when you make mistakes, we celebrate them. 
So we're gonna do this together, and you're gonna do it on behalf of Winnipeg and your own stories, okay? So what we're gonna do is we just, you know, you might, you're, gonna, you're gonna have to stand up. Everyone stand up. I will model it for you, and then we'll do it together, okay? And it's just throwing your hands back and your head back and saying how fascinating. So how fascinating! We just do that, okay? So we're gonna do it together. Everyone out loud, as much as you can and you're able. How fascinating, right? So now we've learned something. That's great, let's move on. So you can sit down again, thank you. You might want to try that with your team at a retrospective or if you are having that failure story right now that I just told you about the four examples and, and you gave us one too, maybe we, we can learn from that and maybe that celebrating is important. I, I, I was able to be at a conference last week with Eve Hanul and, and he said something very similar. Be careful about rescuing your teams from failure Instead, try to help them learn from failure and celebrate it, right? So the Agile community is full of this knowledge already, and maybe you can apply that to some of your project, whether it's Agile or not. Uh, a great example of this for me that kind of hit home this uh, summer at the Agile conference, uh, have you ever play who's played the ballpoint game in this room? Only a handful. I, I've led this game a couple of times, and I should know better. But I'll tell you what happened. Uh, it's basically a, it's a team building, self-organizing game that shows a good example. If you saw Chad's slides uh, for how training their, their scrum teams, it's often part of scrum training and part of Agile training that we do this game. And this is the inaugur inaugural Winnipeg Agile user group meeting and we played the ballpoint game to kind of get across the one, one of the major differences between waterfall and traditional teams uh, to Agile is that we have the self-organizing team and this game nicely illustrates that. But how it works, kind of glossing over, you get two minutes as a team to pass as many golf balls or some other kind of ball around your whole team. How many can you do in two minutes? And then you stop, you assess your process, you try something different, and then you do it again. And you do it again and you watch your numbers go from, uh, you know, you do, might do 30 in the first round and you eventually get into the hundreds because your process can improve so much just by asking the team for help and asking the team to collectively come up with a good idea. I played this game and a variation of it at the Agile conference this summer and I suggested an improvement uh, and what happened was the team agreed, it was a really large team, agreed to try it but during the iteration I noticed that, well, they, they stopped doing it because they didn't think it was working and at the end of the iteration, end of the iteration our numbers were actually way down. We actually, my improvement suggestion, right, at our continuous improvement meetings, we ask employees to suggest improvements all the time. My improvement that I suggested that I thought would actually work failed and miserably. So my first reaction was, well, that's the last time I'm going to suggest an improvement. Right? I'm not going to say anything anymore. I'm going to let someone else do it because that clearly, right, it wasn't a great idea. But really, and then I it quickly caught myself and said, whoa. Well, again, we ask our teams to do this all the time, so it's really important to celebrate that learning and do the how fascinating or the failure bow. So a prime example of how even I got, as an agilist, got caught up into this missing out on the celebrating of failure. This is my oldest. I grew up with uh, four boys in my family, so I have three brothers. Um, we, I didn't experience how girls fight, so I have three girls. This, she's 10, and sometimes our girls will come home from school, or one of them, and they will have a, had a fight with one of their best friends. And you know how that looks. I'm not gonna play with you, I'm not gonna talk to you, and we're gonna, I'm gonna go hide on you. They don't just go boom and be done, right? They come home and it's very sad, very emotional. And my wife's first reaction is to go march down to that school, talk to that other kid and say, do you know how you made my daughter feel? Do you know how it feels to be left out of something, or such? As, I, maybe this is, I, I don't know where I got this from, uh, uh, it's maybe one of the good things as a parent I actually do. Um, I go to her and say, what good learning you did. Now you know how it feels when, someone, when you leave someone else out. And this is going to help you be a better person. This is going to help you be, learn. What good learning you did. Which is, again, a different way of celebrating failure. Uh, and I don't think she always appreciates it in the moment. I, I try to be sensitive of that, of course. Uh, anyways, she's quite ha happy and healthy, so well adjusted. So, how do we take these learning, these failure stories, and move forward? 
I'm going to throw a couple of tips out there. I think the first one was celebrate failure. Here's a, I'm going to throw two more tips out and then a bunch of patterns that we can talk about. Clearly the best way to move forward is verbal persuasion, right? I'm going to assume that you're ignorant of the best way to do something. I'm going to concoct a wonderful argument about how I can convince you that you, what you're doing is wrong and I'm going to spill out that argument to me. I'm going to probably practice it in my head multiple times and suddenly you're going to go, oh, thank you, Steve. That's awesome, right? And then you're going to say, no, that's dumb. And then I'm going to assume you're an idiot and I'm going to go back again and I'm going to say, okay, I'm going to, what did I miss? How did my argument, that, that should have worked. And I'm going to come up with a new argument. I'm going to come back and you're going to say, Oh, thank you, Steve. <laughs> no, you're not. You're going to say, uh-uh, that's not going to work. And now I'm not going to assume that you're ignorant or an idiot, but that you're actually evil. And you just have some purpose behind you for why you're actually disagreeing with me. So, no, that is not the tip. Uh, the book I, a book I read on this actually said, verbal persuasion rarely works in, uh, what's the uh, word, wording? Rarely works in uh, basically complex situations. It hardly ever works. And uh, with your spouse, how does it work? Yeah, exactly. With your kids, how does it work? With your coworkers, how does it work? Sometimes it does, right? But as a whole, in persistent problems, it's not a really great ex strategy. Instead, well, I should say number two, sorry. Remember the coyote. Remember what it feels like to be this person right before this and then right afterwards. So we talk all the time about respecting people, about uh, building trust. That uh, we, Somebody talked about that earlier today. And this is the most important thing. Let's, let's find a safe place to talk about things together. Let's make change and discussion safe. Let's remember that sometimes we're wrong. Maybe I'm coming to you with the best idea in the world, and it's actually not. In six months, again, I might disagree with myself. So if you come to that attitude, that's kind of the, the groundwork that you need to start with. Yes, Linda. I, uh, a year ago, Linda, I was at the book table and I, I just said, hey Linda, which book should I buy? And she said, you should buy mine. <laughs> so I did. And now I read it. And as I'm going through these stories of Winnipeggers, men making changes to their teams, it turns out her patterns in, in, in this book, not her patterns, but the patterns in this book, are littered throughout their stories and littered throughout my story. So I'm going to describe a few of them that worked. Plus there's another book there, Influencer, The Power to Change Anything, which basically says, if you're going to bet on a single source strategy for change, you're going to fail. And they argue for actually uh, six different types of strategies. A book you might want to read later on, I found it fascinating for all kinds of reasons. If you want to look at this later, you can buy them at the back. <laughs> Anyways, thank you, Linda. Um, this is the uh, Linda talk times two, or version two. Okay, so the first pattern that every single group used, I'm going to need volunteers for to illustrate it. Now how much time? We're good. We end at three. Okay, so I'm halfway. That's good. That's good timing. So I need three volunteers to come up and do a nice mundane activity up here. So I'm going to pick on the no one volunteers. So I always take the first the table here. So you two guys come on up. And uh, uh, two is actually going to be perfect. Now the next question is just come stand up here. Does anyone in the room know how to juggle? Anybody a juggler? Yeah, seriously. Oh, good, awesome. How well? How many can you do? How many can you do? Three. Okay, well you can both come on, because I got enough. Now these aren't your enterprise juggling balls, so I apologize. But uh, here, just, just hold on to these for a second. Yeah. Okay. And as soon as you're comfortable, just start juggling, just to show them how it's done, because clearly it's, you'll show how easy this is. All right, look at that. Okay, now, now you go, you guys just go ahead. You saw how it's done. Just, just, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, no, that's not right. How, no, yeah, just come on. That's, well, you're not doing it right. Yeah, I don't know if you're doing it. Keep screaming, maybe he'll, he'll get it. That's right. <laughs> maybe if you watch him a little bit more. Okay, so really this, this is clear, this is what we ask our teams to do and in some places it actually works uh, where you have, you know, people who are ready to juggle three balls at once. But now just try, put two of the balls down and just juggle one. 
You get really used to that. There you go. So yeah, great. So the, the oh, you guys can sit down again. I'll just uh, put the balls in there. Here. Well, before you guys sit down, how did it feel to try to do it all at once? Difficult. Very difficult. Was it fun? Yeah. Would you ever do it again? Yeah. yeah maybe. <laughs> it turns out that when you do the step-by-step -step pattern, and if you remember, uh, no, whose talk was it? It was Johanna's talk yesterday, where she talked about weak versus strong uncertainty avoidance. And maybe this part plays a part in it. There are some teams that can handle multiple practices all at once and let's go. In, most, in lots of cases that I'm familiar with, in fact, all the cases that I'm familiar with, teams are more willing to say, let's do one practice at a time, we'll get good at this one. And we, you know, they run the danger of being accused of unagile because they don't have all the practices down, but it's much easier to bring in one at a time. And uh, again, Friesen's printing, when I interviewed her, after she talked about being blindness, she described this step-by-step -step method and how it worked. And once you start to make those small changes, it makes it much easier to keep going. This is my brother-in-law, the uh, local psychologist celebrity. When there's a breakfast television event and they need to talk to a psychologist, he gets to talk. Uh, and I talked to him about this. And in, with his patients and in the psychological literature, it's the same thing. Change creates tension. So if you try to lift, all of you imagine trying to bench press right now 180 pounds. That's the kind of tension it is, right? Change creates tension. And if you're going to try to bench press 180 pounds right from day one, like if you're just going to go down to, or up to the fifth floor and just go for it, you're all going to give up. You're going to say, I'm never doing that again. It's not possible. I don't like it. I don't need to lift 150 pounds. I can stay with waterfall. So change creates tension. And rather, give them a 30 pound weight or one ball, let them get good at that. And now we move to 40 pounds and to 50 pounds. That's the step by step. And we know this all the time, right? Teaching basketball, we don't teach them to do a complex weave pattern in offense first, or to dribble between your legs or around your back. We just start with, let's just dribble one ball over here, and then let's try one with the left hand. And we're doing our shooting, we might do, yeah, this is the important pose for kids, right? Elbow in and hand over here. We're not shooting from here, we're not shooting over this way, all those ugly things. No duckling elbows. If you're a basketball player and you're doing this, that's just embarrassing. So we teach kids in basketball, we teach kids in weightlifting. When we're practicing for a marathon, we don't run the whole thing all on the first day. Everything is step by step and there's a progression. And like I said, uh, Chad's team, even though he talked about um, starting in September and moving till December, there was lots of stuff before that where some teams were trying it. The idea was there, people were kind of getting a hang of it. So um, I, w I wonder if salesforce.com has some of the same history of people trying it beforehand. Or maybe there are just teams that are willing to go for it. But I would bet on this strategy versus the all at one strategy, personally. And these four teams, including my own, these four organizations, use this first. Oh, and language hunters is very interesting. Um, they correct one thing at a time when you're doing it. Who's the, have you guys done it? It's really neat, eh? And they, you're always doing a bunch of it wrong. And instead of saying, just get better at it and do it, right? We correct one thing. It might be a hand position or it might be something else. Correct one thing at a time, get good at that and keep going. And they also ask, how full are you? And if you're full, you can back out of the game. So when you're making change in your organization, you have to watch. Are people full enough? Maybe they're not ready to try the next thing yet, right? Uh, what, and the Friesen example, one of the team members there said, you know what, after a bunch of change had already happened, maybe we're as good as we can be as a team and we don't need to try anything new. Which is just a really strong signal for how full are you? I'm full, just give me, a time, give me some time to wait before we try the next one. So a really important strategy. These are my, the, all three of the girls. The next important pattern that uh, ev almost every team used was to try experiments, to uh, what's the, the trial run something. And it's amazing if, if, if you're talking to your spouse or anybody else, a friend, and you're trying to convince them of something, you just say, let's just try it for a week. We'll, we'll just do one of them and see how it works. Uh, with Friesen's, when they ran into this problem, they had this flex project that was their consultant left and they had to beat their deadline and they're in big trouble, what they did was they got together as a whole team and he said, and this was right after they had gone to, oh, that's the next part of the story, sorry, I won't talk ahead. They, they decided to work together and say, we're gonna try for a week, we're all gonna tackle a small flex problem to see if we can solve it. We're just gonna try it for a week. And at the end of that week, they evaluated and said, 
this is awesome. We're actually catching on to Flex really fast. And it started to build this kind of team momentum and they just they built on that. So they, they were allowed to just try it for a week. The service guy did it, the power builder guy did it, everyone else was working on this one project. Um, and we do this with our clients. One of the, sometimes our clients are very waterfall and we have to work with them and their process. So we just try to introduce some of the Agile stuff slowly, the ones that make sense, that help us. Uh, planning poker is a great example. So we just, you know, we come to an estimating meeting or a planning meeting with our client and suddenly there's a deck of cards on the table and then we say, I, I know it looks silly, it's a deck of cards and all that, it's crazy, but let's just try a couple rounds and see if you get to like it. And suddenly they see the ownership that happens and how the estimates are getting better and we're talking about things together and they love it. So lots of examples of those. This is, we believe, the, the world large, world's largest planning poker game ever. The Winnipeg Agile User Group, we did, we did a planning, uh, an Agile planning event just to give people an idea of what it looks like and we did planning poker with the whole group. You can see kind of our group's pretty large. Agile is pretty uh, new in Winnipeg, but it seems the group only started in March, but people are coming out of the woodwork and saying, yeah, we were trying some of those things, so now it's really a good idea to hear and I can bring my coworkers which is happening, the big jolt, which is when you're not sure, when you need help convincing somebody by giving someone else to say a word about, like, if I'm giving you a message that planning poker is awesome, paired programming is awesome, then you go and hear someone else say the message, it kind of adds to it. A year ago, I brought two clients to this conference for that very reason, and they talked with you, and they talked with Linda, and uh, they heard the same things, I, mostly. <laughs> no. They heard the same things and suddenly like, oh, now I get it, now I get it, right? So sometimes a big conference like this, and maybe this is a big jolt for your company and for your adoption. Um, a couple of examples, the PSCAD, uh, the auto system, uh, the AutoCAD for the power systems, they heard about planning poker at a conference in Winnipeg two years ago. They went back and immediately tried it, and they loved it. They do it with their clients, they do it with their customers, with their marketing group, as a whole group, and everyone loves it. It builds team ownership and commitment, right? Uh, the following year at the same conference, they heard someone else talking about paired programming. So right after the conference said, well, let's go back. This guy said it was great for him because it aids in transition. It helps to bring developers up to speed. When someone quits, they don't worry about it because everyone knows everyone's job. Uh, the code is really great. You don't need to do code reviews anymore. So they went back and tried it and loved it. Um, the reason that the Friesens team was willing to try Flex for a week as a self-organizing team, essentially are doing everything by everybody together, is because after the, the first Agile Winnipeg event, we played the ballpoint game, which is a self-organizing team. They got the idea that it was safe to try that thing and went back and tried it. So they got ideas from conference, they got convinced, as, convinced at user groups. It can also help you understand the depth of the topic versus the breadth, which you've talked about as an issue. So another pattern that was used by these groups, the just do it. Um, the booked in example, the online scheduling, they knew they were in trouble and they just said, you know what, we're, we're not doing enough automated testing. One of the things we want to try is behavior driven design or behavior driven development. And they didn't argue about it for too long. They just said, you know what, let's just, let's just do it and commit to it and go. And it took them two or three weeks to kind of get good at faking it. And then at two months, they were awesome at it and they're thrilled with the results. Um, Friesen's printing, and they uh, just took down some cubicle walls. They didn't ask, right? Just, we're just gonna take down some walls in between the teams to improve communication, right? Sometimes, I think uh, Eve Hanul last week described it as the uh, ask for forgiveness rather than permission. Uh, the rogue operator, I've heard it described. Sometimes there's a practice that you can just say, I'm gonna do it. I did that with planning poker. Um, PS CAD, when they were having, after this one year thing, they said, you know what, we're going to change direction or we're just going to do it. What we're, the direction we're going to change is we're going to figure out what we can deliver after one year rather than wait till the whole project's done. So let's, and, and that was a big mindset shift for them. Especially, I, I know we think now frequent delivery one year, that's terrible, but that was the direction they were moving and wait till you hear the results now. So just do it. Just start. Pick a practice that the team was going to be comfortable with and go for it. Okay, this is who's been to the uh, aquarium in Euclid? Nobody? If you have, yes, you have. It's a tiny little thing. It's like, yeah, about like this big. 
to that wall. It's a, it, but it's the best aquarium I've ever been to in the whole world. If you have kids and you ever want to plan to go to Vancouver Island, go to that aquarium. It just, it's uh, Euclidus south of Tofino. This aquarium uh, illustrates how change the environment is, is super important. Um, that, when you look at sea stars, they don't really move. You don't see them move, and it's kind of boring. But this has a touch tank where you actually can grab them and pick them up. And they, the people there help you do, uh, show you exercises and, and demonstrations of how to get a sea star to move. And it's very similar to co-location. You take the dangerous sea star that eats all the other ones, and you put it in the tank with all the other ones that aren't moving. <laughs> they smell each other, and suddenly they're like, whoa, here, I'm getting out of here. That guy's coming. I smell him. And, and they are moving a lot slower than that. But it's very interesting. Just by changing a little environmental change, removing cubicle walls so that your team talks to each other, uh, putting up a Kanban board that visualizes your problems so that teams recognize when there's bottlenecks and adjust to it is very important. Um, all of the teams that we talked to used visual boards and found that a Kanban board with whip limits, just a little environmental change, putting stickies on a wall, forced them to look at their bottlenecks and suddenly developers would go to the board and say, ah, oh, I have to test. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna go test. That's it. Or when someone left the team and that kind of specialty would leave, someone else would just pick up their stuff and keep going. So just simple environmental changes can make a big difference. There's your sea Star Wars. Mm -hmm. uh, this one is from the next book, um, the Influence, uh, Influencers book, um, Making the Undesirable Desirable. I told the story of uh, PS CAD before, and they went to uh, the conference a year ago and got, were convinced that paired programming was something they should try. So Mark, the manager there, gave him a lot of credit. He went back to his team and didn't say, we're doing it in this case, because pair programming is something you're going to get a lot of resistance on, right? Is anyone doing pair programming? Do you love it? Yes, it's good. Most... And that is the very common... Uh, misunderstanding of paired programming. It actually, and if it, there's studies that Alistair Coburn did in the was it late 90s or early 2000s, that that's actually not true. That the pair working together, because you're not actually coding a lot, it's more of a design. When you're coding, you're doing a lot more design than you are and talking and thinking than you are coding. That you end up being faster in the end as a pair. Done right. Is that your experience? Yeah, that's right. No, less. And, and a little bit more time. Sometimes, yeah. I mean, you're still doing code reviews, right? Period, right? Pairing almost. You're doing it at the end rather than the beginning. I think the study from Alistair was that you are 10% slower, but with something like 60 or 70% less defects. So in the end, you're faster because your code is better and you have less defects to worry about. Uh, but you won't know that unless you try it for a week. That's my tip. Uh, what he did with his team, he says, you know, I really want to try pair programming here for a while. So he's utilizing a couple of patterns. He wanted to try it for a week. And, and they said, you know what, uh, we don't want to do it as a team. And he said, he asked this really key question, and this is a question to write down. What will it take to get you to do it? What will it take to get you to try it? And one of the guys blurted out, you buy us a big screen TV and we'll do it. So he went and bought a big screen TV. He made the undesirable, I don't want to do this pair program to be desirable by just adding a big screen TV. Right? And then they tried it for a week using the other pattern at, just on operational issues, and that's what they're using it for now, and they loved it. And I'll show you the results of what, how their team is functioning now as a result of that. So as you're thinking about whether pair program might be for you, uh, maybe the results will convince you. So this is the uh, results. Now we've gone through the failure. I've told you some of the tips that they walk through as far as uh, and some of the patterns that they use to make the change. Uh, and maybe some of those are, are utilize, you can utilize. If not, there are a lot more in here and there's a bunch of other patterns that fit, but just not for the whole group. Those are kind of the top six. Freezons, the practices they've introduced since then 
They have co-located their teams just by getting rid of the cubicle walls. They're totally cross-functional. Everyone can do everything now. Um, they're using Kanban as far as so to manage their flow and their whip limits. And because they're in a manufacturing environment as a printer, this kind of makes a lot of sense for them. Uh, they're not doing automated testing yet, but they're using specification by example as a requirements technique to improve communication between their users. And they just took a, a BDD immersion workshop last week. They're trying out pr pretty much right now adding the automated testing into their approach. Um, that project, that Flex project, thought it was a big problem. They delivered on time with very few quality issues and people loved it. They have moved from an I to a we. I think again, Johanna was talking about femininity versus masculinity. They had this environment where everyone was very competitive to each other. And it actually took a woman, one of their developers, to kind of initiate the change from I to we. She said, I'm, not, I'm gonna ignore all of my tasks that I'm assigned to do. And I'm gonna go help every other teammate solve their problems first. And she worked, uh, this is a, over several weeks, she went and said, I'm gonna help you, what do you need help with? Okay, let's sit down and, and solve the problem together. And then once you were good, she moved on to the next person, the next person in the team. So a team of seven, she was doing this, ignoring her own stuff, but it helped them move from that I to the we. A really neat story. Um, and now, just at a conference in Winnipeg, telling their story, in fact, all these three groups told their story in a larger uh, conference in Winnipeg last week to help other teams understand what it takes both to make the change and what it looks like on the other side, why you might want to do it. So tips directly from them, be open about any issues in the transition, be open about any issues that you're having in development and with your projects. Uh, the team focus is super important, that cross-functional team, and you'll find that in all of them. Um, and the servant leadership that Trish uh, Trish exhibited during her team is important. So you've kind of heard some of these in the patterns. So uh, power system, the PSCAD, what they did, they started with frequent delivery. So they started with, let's figure out what we can deliver this year. And now they're delivering weekly. In fact, they can deliver anytime they want, but they only do deliver weekly. Uh, they did planning poker and Kanban. They love their paired programming. Um, they're a cross-functional team as well. They started out not so. Uh, they wrote their own automated testing framework and their own CI framework because of the nature of their project, all the Fortran stuff. So they actually wrote their own and they are using it. So there's lots of open source automated testing tools if you're interested that are free, but they wrote their own. Um, and they can deploy at a button just like the, the high-end free tools you can. They even write tests for the defects, which is really, uh, as someone who's done a lot of testing, that kind of fits nicely in here. It makes me feel good because I hate using defect trackers. And if you can just write a test for it and duplicate it that way and then, you know, it's fixed when it when it's goes green again, that's really fantastic when you kind of avoid some of those miscommunications and the waste of time that a defect tracker can, that, who loves defect trackers? Exactly. So the results, this first one, that first statement is the result of their pair programming. Their juniors become seniors so fast. Their quality improves, their speed is improved. They hire four co-op students every term, and because of this paired programming thing, those co-op students are productive in no time at all and just join in the regular team. And it's all because of paired programming and that team approach. So their results might not mirror yours, but this is, they love it. Velocity is mind-blowing in comparison. I didn't actually get stats. That's my fault. I should have done that. I, am, I don't even know if he has it, but I should have asked for it because I'm sure you'd be interested. But they are delivering all the time, no problem, to their, was it 70,000, 30,000 licenses, right? And they have a, uh, they've got more access to their customers by creating this beta group that gets all the live production updates if they want. So they have about 50 people across the world who get the latest updates and they get feedback from them, but they're using it in a production environment. So. Really neat. Tips. Uh, Mark from this group, the guy who asked that good question, couldn't stop talking enough about how the step-by-step -step approach over several years was super important to them and that it's important to be patient and let those steps finish. He's a, he's a triathloner, right? So it's the same thing. You're not gonna run a triathlon or compete in a triathlon tomorrow. And if I were to try to compete in a triathlon tomorrow, I would fail, be injured, and probably never try again. So he emphasized that over and over again, how important that, pr that pattern was for them. And just like the coyote, remember that you're challenging what people believe, right? Uh, booked in with the online scheduling. 
Uh, so they were already doing lots of agile stuff, but their CI wasn't great, and they had no hardly any automated testing. So they first the thing they did was was kind of upgrade their CI and make it work properly so they could deploy at the uh, click of a button. And then they, they brought in an expert, which is another pattern. They brought in a friend of mine named Amir to teach them how to do BDD. I think, I think he just came in half a day a week or something like that. But he sat with them, showed them how to do it, and within, like I said, two months they were great at it. And their results, um, or they're even doing remote paired programming now, which is, you, we used to think that was nuts, but they're doing that uh, from Winnipeg to the Bahamas. When they switched to BDD, which is basically just automating your functional tests and then writing the code to make those tests pass, uh, they were warned to express that decreased velocity and they experienced the opposite. They're actually faster now that they're doing automated testing and testing up front than they were before. And there's now confidence restored, there's trust restored, everyone's happy. When he goes in, when there's a release, he doesn't have to go and test it anymore. That, they just release it, they do a quick visual inspection to make sure everything's good, and then they're, they're good to go. So they're thrilled with the results, and uh, Mike, the owner, makes some really strong statements about how important this approach of using automated testing is for their environment. And you notice all three stories kind of have that specification by example, or BDD or ATDD, which is acceptance test driven design or development, have used that approach to improve their quality. So his tips from Mike, convince yourself first. I think someone else was talking about that here. Make sure you understand why you're doing the practice that you're doing and why it's important so that when you are talking to someone, he's saying, I'm not so sure about pair programming. Well, I'm sure of it because I've seen the result and here it is. Rather than, well, someone else told me it was good. Right? Make sure you understand why it's good and what, how to use it in your context. This is a neat one. Uh, use people as the argument for change. If we don't make this change, people are going to quit. Because they're not having any fun with all this failing project stuff or the amount of requirements documents that they have to create and they feel like they're changing it all the time and they're not doing anything or the project manager to keep up is updating the project plan so often that he's not actually doing his job. Um, rogue operations, that's the just do it attitude. Uh, again, in context and for certain practices, not for everything. And then go and ask for help when you need it. So the story at Protegra where we have about so since we're a consulting company of about 55 or 60, about 40 of us are kind of in the development track. And so we've adopted practices widely across the whole enterprise. The most important one uh, on the project I've used has resulted in that 1,600% impro improvement in quality and that's specification by example. So I did some stats, so this is the one I have stats for, of the bad project that I told you about before with all the defects. And basically, it's kind of like a number of defects divided by number of project hours, essentially, uh, with also severity considered. And the next project we did, where we kind of had cleaned up our act, learned a little bit more, um, and using specification by example as the quality approach, we had this many defects, five. And none of them made it to production. They were all caught before, and they were all extremely minor. And this is for a website in the US, for a US retailer that's some of you, I'm sure, have used. So it's a really, they have over a million users, etc. cetera. So, uh, the, and the bugs we found were things like, um, I didn't, we didn't know and didn't write a test for, you can have a password at the end of your space. We were trimming the password, of course. That's what you do, right? So it's really small stuff that we found. It was a huge improvement in both communication and quality. Uh, some of our other teams, as, as this one team kind of figured out some of these things, we started spreading it to other teams and one of the guys I was talking to last week said they used to deploy with their CI and then they'd wait for the phone call, right? And they would monitor the system and look at all the numbers. Now they deploy and go for lunch because they, they know nothing's going to happen. And that's for a payroll system, right? This is deploying to production with a payroll system where you get it wrong, someone's going to be mad, very mad, one way or another, either paying too much or too little. So they just deploy and go for lunch because they've done all these things. Um, and of course, that kind of, this kind of change, and for me, uh, that this project failure definitely spurred on my own change for falling in love with Agile, essentially. Uh, I think my wife would probably describe it that way. Uh, she hears about it lots. And also helped us then, all these, these people that we talk to are heavily involved in the user group, and there are others who have similar stories uh, who are kind of the core of the Agile user group and then we're talking to other groups and it's really it's a r great time to be in Winnipeg in the tech community because there's this really vibrant group that's that's meeting. 
So tips for, for me, I just I put down some tips about learning because all the tips they said before, all the stuff that we used at Protegra at Well, very similar stuff. Sometimes we just did it, sometimes we did step by step, sometimes we treated things as an experiment, uh, and those kind of things. But as far if you want to learn more about Agile, if you're in that place where you're not, you're still being convinced, uh, well, after I had this big project failure, I went and listened to, I think, if not everyone, pretty close, every single Agile podcast that exists on the internet. I got the good stuff and the bad stuff and started filtering it out. So I heard all your voices before I met you. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Uh, yeah, many times too. Yeah, it is a scary thing. Uh, you go to an Agile conference and you hear this voice, and you're like, hey, that's Bob Payne, I don't even have to look. Right? Um, so, a really great source, and I think someone else was suggesting earlier that Twitter is a fantastic source for Agile knowledge. There's all kinds of stuff out there. Uh, and you don't have to be on Twitter to kind of get the knowledge. You can just go to the website and do some searches for Agile and stuff, and you can get a lot of the great content. Um, of course, there are lots of articles and stuff, and I encourage you to support this user group here in Vancouver and attend if you're not already. The conference is great, the, their, group, their, their uh, regular meetings are also great. And volunteer and get involved, get to know some of the people. And all this has meant that for all these teams, you could probably again, if you dug a little deeper, you would see some holes in all of their strategies, some practices that are missing. Not all of our developers do full-time TDD, for example, right? Not all of their developers, the one team is just starting their automated test kind of story this week. But all of us are moving in that direction to the left, which I, I think Agile is a direction. It's not are you Agile or not, it's are you moving towards in that direction. So they're all moving towards individuals and working software, customer collaboration, responding to change. And what's happening is they have happy customers and happy employees. So it's fantastic. Some of the other patterns that we use there, but now I want to hear, we have 15 minutes left for questions, or if you want to tell your terrible story, uh, I wonder actually if any of you have a story of failure like this that has moved you towards change. So any questions, any comments, any stories you want to share? I can share the mic. Nobody? Who's got, who had the worst story besides him? You do. Does anyone else have a story of Agile adoption that's similar to the four you heard today? Starting with a big, hey, we're in pain, let's try to move. Does anyone have a story like that? Does anyone, okay, let's find out. Who's, who thinks their team, by my definition here, is Agile? This is, this is my definition, not the community. Just a handful. Right. Do you have, well, your story of getting towards this direction, what, what did that look like? Did it look similar to this at all? But we, when I joined the company, we are already agile, so uh, I don't know the, the process before. Right. We have to be waterfall and to move to agile. Mm -hmm. But I'm working with Stefan, so... Oh, I see. So he can tell you the story. How about you? Oh, you're all the same. Is anyone else not? Okay. <laughs> so do you know if you had, before you were agile, if you had a story like this? Okay, there you go. So maybe I'm the only one. Uh, that maybe it's just Winnipeg that does it this way. I don't know. I'm, I'm curious because I would love to interview more of you 
uh, to see if this is kind of the, you know consistent with. I mean, I, I, you guys have worked with a lot more teams. Do you hear stories like this where there's is it often that big pain is the impetus for change? No. Yeah. So it's just a fluke that I interviewed four teams and they're all the same. <laughs> Yeah. So that it's been going on for so long that they finally say, I just can't take it anymore. Well, that's, that's basically what these, that's a simple, I mean, my story is a little different, but uh, the three other teams, that's how they would echo it. I just can't take the quality issues anymore. I just can't take the, you know, whatever. Yeah. Right. The, the build up of small things for so long. That's right. And so then I wonder, based on the organizational research we talked about, the teams that are doing good enough without Agile, because they are not failing as, as much as the rest of us did in, in the waterfall process because of circumstances or whatever, if they're missing out, and, and that's, you know, that pattern uh, of teams only learn from failure, or learn more from failure rather than, than less than, than from success, uh, sometimes it takes a team to fail before they're going to switch. So. I'm, uh, by the way, I'm not suggesting that if you want to convert your team to Agile, that you, that you can tank a project. Don't, don't take that away from this. But maybe do take away, if you're on that project, where the, it's gaining that sense of, uh, that maybe that's actually the hope. Uh, there's also the concept of continuous improvement, so whether you're using uh, a waterfall approach or an Agile approach, but yeah. just to keep that in that sense of continuous improvement. That's right. Yeah. So anyone else have an answer for that? Why would you pick Agile? There are many reasons not to, is what you're saying. And I, that's what I've found too, especially if the team doesn't want to. Right? If the team doesn't want to do any practice, don't force them to do it. That's, that's, that's been my experience anyways. Or the customer. We again, we deal with customers, and we often have to adopt their practice. So we don't force it on them. We're kind of a little bit subversive about it. Eventually, sometimes we add some practices that make that we know are going to help. Sometimes we ask permission. Sometimes we don't. Depends. It depends on the practice. Yeah. So that's a good question. That's back to the finding a yeah. Yeah. So again, uh, again, without getting into the kind of space of the structure, but I've also heard that by the waterfall approach, that you can find out to find them on that. Yeah, for sure. So you can still get to the rapid growth, uh, rapid feedback, and get to the structure. So the question is, you know, I think I can have a system that's a lot of people. Why add, uh, why not something else? Why not put the doors into something else? Right. Well, have you ever worked on a project and at the end of the project, you do a lot of work? And on the next project and out of context. And yeah. by the way, the next project is probably completely different. Mm -hmm. So I've heard of some teams, uh, one of the podcasts I listen to, of course, uh, where they found Agile just by doing a continuous improvement process. <coughs> they met together every week or two and said, what can we do to make our process better? And they ended up with Agile. Uh, Friesen's Printing had that process already in place. They have that as a company. Uh, that all departments have to report on what improvements they're going to make and what they're going to try every year. And they print a book, of course, since they're a printing company. And they have a full day meeting where they talk about those things. For Friesen's printing, that was already embedded. And then Agile was the place where they kind of found a nice home where that was embraced even more. And they could keep adding practices that made sense. And suddenly those 
practices were actually helping them deliver better and their quality was improving, their teams were happier. So I think sharing stories like this is one, one way to consider whether Agile is better. Uh, for all four of these teams, their results, or for these organizations, they're thrilled with the results. So but, uh, personally, my, again, I was really good at waterfall. And so it was a little bit of a loss to switch. Um, I'm super glad I did. I, I test out these practices at home. I planned Mother's Day using Kanban boards with my kids, and it worked fantastically. Uh, the, our, their, our customer was delighted. <laughs> yeah. She had two breakfasts in bed, not just one. <laughs> That's right. So. Uh, mm hmm. So what what criteria do you have? Uh, the from, uh, from the, uh, from the, uh, from the team, the product, the type of product, the type of uh, technology, So which ones are suitable for agile in your organization? So, does anyone want to comment that this problems like that are not suitable for Agile? Does anyone have experience in this room with creating a really complicated design using Agile methods, where it's not trial and error, but it's planned well in advance? I think the John Deere, if he was, Chad was still here, John Deere, they're creating some really complex stuff and they're building it Agile. It's both, yeah, because they have these screens that are sitting on the tractors that people are using. Uh, in, my, in my experience, uh, the, I, the, uh, th those kind of reasons for not using Agile are often, uh, they're valid concerns, for sure. Uh, but it, uh, Michael Feathers was in the room talking about how you can do complex designs from the ground up, or Bob Martin, or Martin Fowler, all those guys. Uh, this, is no, this is something that's done. Agile doesn't stop you from um, building a great design on the way and having a change tolerant. Um, it, it's, it works for those two. The, the only, in fact, the only place I've seen Agile not work is when the team didn't want to do it. That every other project can benefit from the short feedback loop of, here, we built exactly what we thought you want. Is it exactly right? Okay, now we're going to build on that one. Is this, again, right? Yeah, and then this can write. And it's not that you don't have a plan. Uh, one, of the, one of my favorite plans, planning techniques for Agile is the user story mapping. Um, if you haven't seen that, it's really great. I learned it here last year from Jeff Patton. And uh, it's a really great technique for visualizing your plan in a, in, for the whole project or product. I don't have personal experience with that, but I've read enough blogs about teams doing that with Agile. And the process can change, and right, it's got to be in context. One of the things they do is they update their part of their done criteria for each user story that they complete, is they have to complete those FDA documents as well. Um, I've done some work where they have to do, there's some government regulations, and again, that just becomes part of their project. Maybe for this iteration, you've got to have your FDA stuff done the week before or the iteration before. So there's different ways you can handle it, but I've seen it and heard about it being done. 
And I see a bunch of nodding in the front row up here too. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It becomes more difficult. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I think my experience with en big, larger enterprises in Winnipeg is that their agile adoption is a lot slower and more difficult and pain and more painful. Uh, but there are teams within there that aren't giving up and that are keep trying and that are using patterns like we talked about to slowly grow it over time. So. Uh, who knows what that's going to look like. I can't tell you that they've made it because they haven't yet, but uh, more and more people are showing up at the Agile user group from those organizations, so that's good. We're happy about that. And really, it's just about improving your process. So if you can pick some stuff from Agile and then maybe that, you know, and try it, maybe that will convince you to try another one and another one, or maybe it won't. But any other questions? Okay, thank you very much, 3 o'clock, so thank you.